Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Cy Alba. I'm a partner in a government contracts group. I'm here with my partner, Matt. Um, and we're going to be talking about False Claims Act implications for M&A transactions. I know we've done a lot of things on the FCA generally, and we thought it would be a good idea just given some of the things we've seen recently in some of our transactions. So I got to go through something that's more tailored to M&A activity and things that the, the buyer really is going to have to be worried about with regard to the False Claims Act. Um, so again, I'm here with Matt. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Matt Feinberg. I'm the co-chair of Blair Mazza's False Claims Act and Audits Investigations Group. And I'm also a litigator. I handle False Claims Act matters. And like Sai said, recently we've had some False Claims Act matters come up during, in the process of um, working on M&A transactions. And we thought this would be a good opportunity to give you all uh, the lay of the land about where things are going and, and how, um, how things have, have gone over the last six to 12 months. Yeah, again, Sai Alba and our government contracts group and Matt and I work a lot together on these FCA issues. And you know, historically, I've done a lot of FCA work from all different types of angles. And so we're going to go through this together. Uh, for people who don't know, um, Polaro Maza is kind of a kind of full service shop for a lot of our, our clients dealing with the government contract side of things, the litigation side of things like Matt and I do, but also labor and employment and the business and transaction side, which is where a lot of the M&A stuff comes into play. And I do a lot of the uh, GovCon side of the M&A transactions as, as well. So before we get started on the content of our presentation, I do want to let you know that um, although we are lawyers, this webinar is not intended to give you legal advice um, and or, nor create an attorney-client relationship. If you have any questions regarding a specific situation you might be going through or you anticipate you might be going through in the future, or one, frankly, that you've gone through in the past and you want to talk to us specifically, we'd be happy to talk to you um, after the webinar. But for purposes of this webinar, um, your situation may differ from the information that we're providing today since we're giving a high level and general presentation. Um, so don't assume that everything we say today will apply to your situation. Um, so we're going to start today by giving um, hopefully a, a brief uh, review of what the False Claims Act is for those of you who don't have any experience with the FCA or talk a little bit about what types of conduct can create an FCA violation. And once you have that background, we'll talk quite a bit about um, how the FCA impacts an M&A transaction. Side so specifically mentioned um, issues that affect the buyer. We'll also be talking about uh, issues that affect the seller as well. Um, so to get that started, um, a little bit of background on the FCA. It was originally created during the Civil War um, to prevent uh, companies uh, um, and uh, uh, small business owners from selling decrepit horses and faulty gunpowder to the, the government army. Um, and so since that time, it has expanded significantly um, to become the primary vehicle for the government to collect money either obtained through misrepresentation um, or money that is in the hands of a third party that, that belongs to the government. Um, a little bit of a primer on what the False Claims Act actually is. Uh, it relates to claims. That is a request for money or property, such as an invoice um, or a, a, um, an obligation to pay the government, even if it doesn't appear in writing. Um, when we talk about something being false, we mean that it is um, uh, the entitlement to the funds was either improper, incorrect, unlawful, or unjustified, or it may be totally justified but supported by a misrepresentation of fact. Not all incorrect claims will rise to a level of a violation. Um, knowledge is required, and knowledge means um, actual knowledge, reckless disregard for the truth or deliberate indifference. And when I talk about deliberate indifference, we're talking about the ostrich, ostrich principle, uh, where a company sticks its head in the sand to um, fraud going on around them, and they do nothing um, to prevent their company from engaging in it. 
Uh, the False Claims Act has both civil and criminal components. Most of the time you're going to see uh, a civil False Claims Act violation. That essentially is just a request from the government or a lawsuit from the government to return money um, or to pay damages. Um, the criminal component is for the more egregious False Claims Act violations where there's usually a deliberate intent to defraud the government um, and there are obviously criminal penalties um, where the company can be convicted um, but also the perpetrator of the company's fraud, so someone who signed a document and submitted it to the government. Yeah, and it's not a value thing. The more egregious, it could be a small amount but still be like, just straight up fraud knowing fraud so it's not like a value thing just so people are aware so one of the uh, important ways that the fca implicates an m&a transaction is that fca liability can follow the company um, when you're acquiring a company um, the the underlying company that you're acquiring if they are subject to liability the buyer takes on that liability if you're acquiring an asset such as for a government contractor a specific contract or contract vehicle the liability may not necessarily pass to the buyer however you must consider whether the transfer of the asset is a fraudulent conveyance um, there are some other things you have to consider specifically if you are taking over performance of the seller's contracts for a specific contract and an asset purchase which is experiencing an ongoing False Claims Act violation, such as improper billing, uh, improper original certifications to justify the contract, or uh, limitations on subcontracting issue, and you're not correcting those mistakes, that could result in liability for both the buyer and the seller. Yeah, and also there, there could be mandatory disclosure obligations too so if you learn about some of the stuff matt just talked about you, you very likely if you think something rises to the level of false claim which we usually recommend getting counsel involved to do an investigation because there's legal questions about whether you rise to that level of actual knowledge recklessness um, or indifference and so if you've reached those levels you might have to disclose something so you might buy something and immediately have to turn around and disclose an, an, an issue. Um, so that's kind of how that can come up as well. The reason it's important is so damages can e exceed whatever the earn out is or even the value of the company. I've had one recently where I was looking at a potential transaction. The company was selling for $23 million, which seems like a lot, but um, I was looking at some of the, the company's practices and it raised real concerns about whether or not they were misrepresenting their status or the status of their prime contractors. And when you add it all up, the potential damages here, I calculated to be around $45 million. So you, you can see that these things go up very fast, especially small business violations, because then it's three times the value of a gross contract. Um, and that's what we're talking about. There's a mandatory damages component, there's treble damages in certain circumstances for certain false certifications like small business status it's statutory so it's automatically the full value of the contract and if you hit knowing or reckless or uh, deliberate indifference it can be trebled and when you have that it, it the numbers get astronomical i've had a lot of these small business contracts where it might be an idiq and they might have gotten a lot of work on it you're talking 80 million dollars over the course of five or ten years and if the government takes it out the full amount, it would be three times that, plus these statutory penalties of 12,000 and change to 25,000 and change per violation, which would be usually per invoice. So if you have five invoices, 60 over, sorry, 12 invoices over five years, 60 invoices times $25,000, plus three times the gross value of the contract, contracts potentially plural if it's a business practice that's improper you you can see like how quickly these things can balloon to be far in excess of the value of the entire company much less the escrow or the earnout in addition when you're dealing with some of these m a transactions and you're putting a purchase agreement together for instance a lot of times you're used to saying okay we'll look at three years or the next 12 months or if something comes up, we'll come after you. 
if you're the seller, you'll indemnify us for these certain things for a short period of time. But when you talk about this small, the uh, False Claims Act, rather, you're talking about six years. So at least for all the GovCon reps and warranties and all the comments that have been made to the government, we would always recommend having at least a six year period on that look back period where the person is repping and warranting that everything has been kosher for at least that six year period. Uh, but they're also pushing to have these things potentially go up to 10 years. There's certain current examples where it could go up to 10 years in certain circumstances, but it's rare that they would go from six years to, to 10 years. It's usually just that six year period. However, one notable exception, likely exception, is for PPP loan fraud. That's the next thing that the Congress is pushing through and will likely get passed. And it's going to extend the statute of limitation on PPP fraud from six years to 10 years. And there's also current legislation to try to push all False Claims Act matters from six years to 10 years, which would be pretty extreme because I know in all these deals, you want to get it done, you want to move on. Most sellers are willing to say, well, I don't know what's going to happen 10 years in the future. I don't know where I'm going to be even six years in the future. But they know what they've done, or they should. And so it makes sense to have these reps and warranties survive for a longer period of time because that's the statute of limitations. When you're talking about torts, it's three years. When you're talking about a contract, it's generally four years, three to four years, in less like generally, uh, but it varies state to state. But that's the stuff where you might not, people might be used to those time frames or even 12 months, not six years, 10 years. But when you're talking about the FCA, it can be a lot longer. And uh, I just want to jump in really quickly. I think I have a transcription error here. The the statute of limitations size rights, it's generally six years, but it is six years from the time the government official charged with investigating the fraud knew or should have known, but never longer than 10 years. Um, so if the fraud was committed in, you know, we're in 2022, if the fraud was committed in 2013, um, but the government official charged with investigating the fraud didn't know about it until, uh, say, six months ago, the statute of limitations for that claim is, under current law is going to be 2023. But that doesn't always save you because there, as Cy mentioned, you might be sending uh, at one invoice a month for the entire year or there might be a continuing violation. There may be invoices that were submitted that are a False Claims Act violation um, on a contract that happened within the last 10 years. So sorry about the clarification on the slides. We'll make sure we um, get that changed. But generally speaking, the, the, the thing to take from this is that there's a very long shelf life. So in an M&A transaction, you might need to think, particularly where there's a possible indication of um, an FCA violation or a close call on an FCA violation, you might want to extend your indemnification clauses and your look back periods a little bit further to make sure that you have a better picture of the transaction before, um, before signing on the dotted line. So again, we're going to speed through this part just to give you a, a sampling of what type uh, of activity can create an FCA matter. Um, first, there are two types. There's a government-initiated matter and what's called a key TAM matter. Um, a government-initiated matter typically arises out of an audit or an investigation uh, by an Office of Inspector General or by a contracting officer making a referral to the Department of Justice or to the Office of Inspector General. There's also, most agencies have a direct whistleblower hotline where they can make reports. Um, and that is an investigation that's going to be conducted either by an OIG or by the Department of Justice. The key TAM matter is sometimes referred to as a whistleblower complaint. You'll probably hear that in more common parlance. Um, that is where a private litigant files a lawsuit under seal with a federal court, um, notifies the federal government, and the federal government then create, um, uh, commits to doing an investigation to determine whether or not it's a viable FCA claim that the government is interested in intervening um, in the litigation. Um, the key TAM provisions of the False Claims Act heavily incentivize whistleblowers. Um, they give them a portion of any recovery from a settlement or verdict. Um, and a whistleblower doesn't necessarily have to be a company insider. Um, they could be a competitor 
um, or a, a disgruntled former employee or an, an employee who is literally sitting across the table um, in a boardroom from you. There are some restrictions on how that the KETAM provisions of the False Claims Act apply, but generally speaking, um, you could, in an M&A transaction, for instance, have an employee of the former company, if you were to per if you're a buyer um, and you lay off some of the employees upon purchase um, or convert them to an independent contractor with a, an eventual term termination, then those individuals could be the whistleblower that, that files an FCA violation um, or sorry, a key tam suit that results in an FCA violation finding. Um, and so you need to keep those issues in mind as well before um, before finalizing you the papers for your M&A transaction. Yeah, it's funny. I even had one where it was the seller human being who sold the company. That person felt like they were getting the shaft from the buyer for certain reasons. It turns out that after like years and years of going through subpoenas and settlement negotiations and all of that, we then found out later that the, the person who sold the company and got you know paid and just kind of kept afloat, kept alive by the payment of this company was able to retire, that person was the person that filed the complaint, which started a five year plus investigation into the, into the buyer and the selling entity itself. And so all these things can happen. And again, like Matt said, whistleblowers are incentivized, they're, they're paid, they can be paid uh, to file these things and, and win, they can get a portion of the proceeds. So um, for purposes of the False Claims Act, there are a few different uh, types that the statute ex, um, expounds uh, a bit on. The first is the sort of bread and butter False Claims Act violation. It's actually submitting a false claim like a a false invoice, a request for payment from the government, an application for payment on a construction contract that is itself incorrect. You're bidding um, at the beginning, saying that you're going to do work for a certain amount. You don't get an approval from the government or a modification that changes the values of your products. And then you um, submit an invoice to the government that has the products at a, a different price. That would be one example. Um, you can also have a false record or false statement claim, and these can be either expressed or implied. This happens frequently when you're bidding on a contract as an 8A or an STVOSB or hub zone company. Um, and essentially you're submitting your proposal to the government as uh, a qualifying entity, socioeconomic entity, you're awarded the contract and you perform it. Um, you have either expressly or impliedly certified that you're qualified for the contract. If you're not, that's a False Claims Act violation. That's not the only type of certification you're making. For instance, you might be making certifications about your compliance with various statutes or regulations, including cybersecurity requirements. Um, you might be certifying that you've paid all of your subcontractors. So this is heavily dependent on the terms of your contract specifically for an express certification and the implied covenants that you're making with the government in performing a contract for instance cybersecurity. there's also a reverse false claim which is a complicated way of saying that the government is um you're holding money that, he, that the government is entitled to so for instance this might be an overpayment um or uh the government realizes down the road that there's been a, uh, an improper billing amount and the government is seeking repayment of that money. Um, this also happens in the construction context, context because um, surety companies, for instance, and this is sort of a hot button issue for the FCA, um, if there's a violation of the underlying construction contract, the surety is theoretically obligated to pay out the, um, the value of the breach. Um, and that if the surety doesn't do that, if the notifications aren't made to the government, then the surety would theoretically, as the theory goes, um, be uh, in possession of money owed to the government. And then finally, there's a conspiracy um, element to the, to the False Claims Act where um, 
which requires two or more uh, individuals or entities conspiring together to commit any one of the first three types of False Claims Act violation. So a um, couple questions about why these different types of FCA violations can impact government contractors. I've given you those. Uh, we're not really talking about private entities here, but if you're a buyer that's never done government contracting before and you're buying a government contractor to try and enter into the government contracting industries, these are things you need to think about and you need experienced M&A counsel with government contracts experience to understand what you may be getting into. And even there's like, if you're buying a healthcare company that does a lot of Medicare stuff, that's another big false claim. So it's any time you're making any representations to the, the government at all. Um, I think it kind of went through all of these examples. So this is just the stuff that Matt was just going through. Um, there's slides I think will be available that, that kind of go through each of the different pieces and uh, he, just, he just walked through them. Um, and I will say like on the implied false claim piece, that's where a lot of people get tripped up because if you're dealing especially with federal contractors there's a lot of far provisions that are just shoved in the contract and a lot of times they're not even in full text they're just the number and i would think a lot of people don't even look them up to say well what what are they some ones like slave labor or human trafficking that stuff i think people will try to assume well i think i'm good there um, that some of the other ones are much more uh, much more nuanced and you have to realize that if it's in the contract and you're signing the contract you're saying you are going to comply with all of those and in some cases have complied already in the case of like small business stuff when you submitted the proposal and you're you're held to, to that as if you had written out I hereby swear that I'm in compliance with these very particular cybersecurity requirements let's say if you've signed a contract that has that requirement in it, you've already said that impliedly. So again, we'll make sure that these slides are made available. If you would like a copy, please reach out to me or to Sai and we'll provide them. Um, but basically everything that was on the last several slides was what I what I already said. So you're not missing anything if you don't have access to them right now. Right. Um, okay, so now kind of getting into more of the meat of stuff. Some of the recent trends out there in FCA enforcement, uh, we wanted to walk through because this is the hot buttons that we think if you're selling, you should look at your sort of portfolio of what you have going on, make sure you're, you know, especially make sure you're compliant in these areas. Of course, you wanna be compliant in everything. And if you're a buyer, making sure that you do appropriate due diligence on these issues in particular. The numbers that we're talking about for these small, these uh, FCA recoveries keep getting bigger and bigger. It seems like every, every year. Um, last year, it was about 5.6 billion recovered. That's the second highest ever. And there's expectation that 2022 isn't gonna be that far behind. And the, uh, the DOJ and the federal government are pushing to seek out fraud, especially in the PPP program especially with small business issues and the mentor protege program. In particular, when it looks at the small business issues, again, the numbers there are astronomical because of the way Congress and its infinite wisdom has decided that for small businesses in particular and the certifications there, they should be calculated on the basis of the entirety of the contract, the gross value of the contract as a matter of law. Whereas usually if you're talking about a false claim act, maybe you'll say overbilling. The overbilling is where the liability lies, not in the total value of the contract. So if your contract was $10 million and you overbilled $100,000, you could potentially be liable for the $300,000. And if that was only on one invoice, it would be $300,000 plus up to $25,000, $325,000. That same contract, if you never falsely billed anything, but you were, outside of the requirements of the small business program that you were bidding on that same 10 million dollar contract you'd be looking at 30 million dollars in liability plus it was a five-year contract the 25,000 times 60 for every every invoice um that seems unfair to a lot of people because you know you're a small business and maybe everything wasn't perfect 
but you were either maybe trying to do the right thing, but DOJ looks at this a lot of times from the prosecutorial lens and everybody's a bad guy. So that's my sort of take on it. If they see anything being wrong and it's ended up on their desk from an IG or a whistleblower or something, a lot of times they look at that trying to find you guilty as opposed to looking at you and giving you the benefit of the doubt. So you need to realize that. And there's a lot of things that go into that eligibility, which we'll get into in a minute as well. It's not just, were you certified or were you small in your good faith estimation? There's other things like limitation on subcontracting and performance of work rules that are really important as well. In addition, when you're talking about the small business side of things, there's also the matter of protege program. And this, we have seen a pretty substantial uptick in the number of mentor protege cases being investigated by the Department of Justice, either through key TAM actions or through direct referrals from contracting officers to an IG, which then oftentimes gets kicked up to the Department of Justice. And in this context, what they're looking for is, and what I've seen recently is this whole question of, well, how far does the mentor protege program protect you? How far do those the items that you've put in your mentor protege application about the assistance you're going to provide, how much protection does that actually give? DOJ's position pretty clearly is that it's not a get out of jail free card or get out of liability free card. It's something that could protect you if you follow it, not just to the letter of what you wrote in the mentor protege agreement or your interpretation of it, but that you followed it in the interpretation given by SBA IG or by the Department of Justice. And on top of that, my experience has been, it's not just what's written in their interpretation of it, it's what should have been meant to meet the spirit of the program. So if you're in a mentor protege relationship, and let's say you, you've put in there that you're gonna assist with proposal preparation, and you kept it broad, you kept it vague, because you wanna give yourself wiggle room, but what, what does it mean? Maybe in some cases, you're gonna really write a proposal. In other cases, the protege is gonna take the lead, but maybe you're gonna have a lot of involvement in certain aspects. Well, both arguably the language in that mentor protege agreement that just says assist with preparing proposals is broad enough to cover all examples. Well, I've seen things where the Department of Justice has stepped in and said, writing the proposal for someone even if it's maybe the first time someone's done it. And maybe you said, well, I'm gonna write it for them in the first place. And then maybe in future ones, we're gonna do less and less as they learn more and more. Well, DOJ is gonna want, if there's a whistleblower, there's some investigation for one reason or another, they're gonna look at that and they're gonna say, okay, well, how much did they do? What work on this proposal as this example did the protege do versus what did you do? And they're going to look for, they're going to subpoena you, and they're going to look for all the emails un, under the sun. And so what does it look like? And I always say that the best test for this stuff is, let's say the, D, the FBI or DOJ knocked your door down, guns drawn, put all the employees in separate rooms, and started asking them about how things actually went down. What would they say? What would they actually say without you and with fear of, of law, law enforcement? That's like the best test, I think as to whether or not you're doing things appropriately. And so if you have a hunch, if you're buying, or let's say you're selling and you're looking at everything you've done, if you're pushing the boundaries in certain areas, or if you're looking at this and you said, well, yeah, we're supposed to be helping our protege, we're three years or four years into this, and we've really never transitioned from helping by doing to helping by teaching, I think you could put yourself at some risk there. And as a buyer, you might want to inquire and look into those issues. Another really important and, and trying to address a question that came in about the types of mentor protege problems that can lead to FCA violations. Um, so another thing you got to think about is limitations on subcontracting, because it's not so easy just to say, as long as the prime is doing 50.1% of the work, you're safe. That's just not exactly how the mentor protege program works. It's also not how the mentor protege program works for um, construction contracts. And we're going to talk about this in a little bit, but a lot of the examples we have seen of late, and we've seen, as I mentioned, a number, have related to either the limitations on subcontracting, the uh, mentor 
taking an oversized role in the operations, um, stepping over the line of instruction and mentorship and taking an, a, a, a position as an operator or a manager of the protege. And um, the, the last example I give is where a, a mentor is almost treating the protege like a pass-through entity. So in an instance where, uh, for instance, the mentor is the incumbent, say, 8A contractor, but they've graduated during the period of performance from the 8A program, um, they get into a mentor-protege arrangement with, with a protege so that the mentor will have the opportunity to um, continue to perform a portion of the work. And then ultimately what happens is that um, a, a small portion of the work is done by the protege. Um, the mentor is doing all of the heavy lifting and performing all the final um, aspects of the contract. DOJ is definitely going to look on that um, with a lot of skepticism. Um, and then examples like Sai said, where maybe you get away with um, a little more heavy handedness by the mentor on the front end to, to assist in building up a company. Um, once the protege is sort of on its feet, um, even if wobbly, even if they have wobbly legs, the DOJ is going to look at that with a lot of skepticism um, and understanding that the mentor protege program is about building up the protege and giving them the experience so that they can have a, an on-ramp into federal government contracting and more advanced contracting. They're going to try and enforce the protege MP program um, in a way that that drives toward those goals. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. Um, and then a, another piece of this that's also gained prominence on another article this morning is cybersecurity. Um, this is something that DOJ is going to really start pushing for, especially as more and more issues are found where, whether it's China, Russia, you know, you name it, there's breaches in cybersecurity. And especially in cases where contractors might have been wronged. I think there's an increased risk where someone gets hacked and let's say they even lose money and they report a theft of funds. We've seen the Department of Justice come in and instead of sort of helping you, like you might report this to the FBI because a lot of the stuff's international, right? You might report it to the FBI that there was like a major theft or a breach and somebody from wherever stole your money. FBI then goes talks to the Department of Justice. The Department of Justice then wants to talk to you. And you say, great, people are taking me seriously. And then they sit down and they start asking you questions about what you had in place and what your cybersecurity was, or whether any of this money that uh, the government was paying you maybe should have gone to certain other uses from a compliance perspective. And they start interrogating you. So not only did you lose all this money to some hacker a third party, you're you're now also under investigation by the government for your own problem, for a false certification. So just be aware that, that is serious. And then also the prohibition on use of Chinese covered technology, uh, it, the telecommunications or surveillance technologies. That's also a big issue right now. And I think it's just going to increase. We're still waiting for some of the guidance on what exactly uh, these final rules on the, the, the Section 889 stuff from the National Defense Authorization Act of 2019, what that's really going to mean as far as how far is the government going to look? What about international contracts? What about contracts in countries where the entire backhaul is Chinese-provided technology, prohibited technology? Can you even do work there? The Director of National Intelligence has given certain waivers for USAID and uh, to operate, especially in Africa, where the infrastructure is heavily Chinese. So those things are existing, but in a lot of other cases, there's a gray line there on how far you should have inquired as to whether or not you were using this prohibited technology. And so these are other things that you need to be aware of. And I know the big companies, I did a deal with uh, that had a major communications company as the buyer, um, and they looked at all of this. They wanted to know, what did you do? What sort of reasonable inquiry did you do? Did you catalog all the equipment that you're using? Let me see it. Did you catalog all your employees' personal devices where they're accessing email? Like all of those, those things. 
Um, another thing that's been coming up more and more is the GSA price reduction clause as well, where if you have a GSA schedule contract and you have commercial and federal work and the work you're selling commercially is similar or identical to the work you're selling on the GSA schedule, to the extent you sell that to any commercial entity at a price lower than what you're providing to the government, it's actually a little different because the government price should be not just lower than what you're selling commercially, but lower by a certain percentage that you've promised. So if you're selling it below that, such that that little, say, 2% threshold, the promised discount you've given is only 1%, all of that money over and above that, that percentage, that extra 1%, or if you've gone lower, it could be even more extreme over however many years, all the way back to the statute of limitations could all be re recovered. And that's something that we've seen happen more and more where people are, are going to sell their company and they've never even paid attention to it. In some cases, they didn't even know the price reduction clause even existed. And they say, well, why are, they, why are they asking me all these questions? This is a small deal. You know, they're, they're asking me to do all this extra work. It's a pain in the butt. They should just buy me and we'll move on. And then we start looking at the questions and we say, oh, they're looking at price reductions issues. What have you guys done to make sure your commercial sales are compliant? They say, what do you mean? What are you really talking about? That's, that's a major red flag. And as a buyer, you want to look into this. You want to know what are the policies that they've had on this? Let me see them. And if the answer is we don't have any, that could be a problem. Um, construction. Construction is one of those areas where, especially when you combine it with the small business programs and the mentor protege programs, this is a major focus of the Department of Justice because they look at certain construction issues like joint ventures and small business joint ventures, and they see that all of those things in their estimations are ripe with fraud, or it's, it's, it's fraud. There's a lot of ubiquity in the, the fraud that, that is, is going on when you're, when you're talking about small business mentor protege small business joint ventures in particular because of the way the limitation on subcontracting rule are, are calculated and i'll get into that in, in a minute as well and lastly paycheck protection program fraud that is something that we've just started to see and it's it's only going to increase from there right now there was some law firm that filed a bunch of key tam actions against a lot of small fish and we've seen the Department of Justice start to settle those where people have um, not necessarily admitted liability, but have had to pay back the, the PPP loans. And also if they got multiple loans, have had to pay them back. And then there's a real question about, well, what if one loan was fraudulent, the other one wasn't fraudulent? Can you get, can you get forgiveness on the one that wasn't fraudulent versus the ones that were fraudulent? And that's sort of an open question that we're going to have to have litigated through SBA and the Office of Hearings and Appeals. But aside from that, we think there's bigger PPP things on the horizon where some of the private equity backed PPP or some of the larger companies that got higher values. We're not seeing those cases right now, but because they're so large, they're probably going to investigate them diligently and make sure they have solid cases. Because with all of these, every single one of these issues or any FCA issue, oftentimes what happens if you have a key TAM complaint, it takes a couple years between the time a complaint is filed and the time the Department of Justice might even issue its first subpoena. So you might not even know something's happened for years after it's already occurred and you're already on the, the radar or the company you're buying is already on the radar. And it's not for two years to get the subpoena. And it might be a few years after that until they come back to you after you've given the subpoena. And so just negotiating these things can take five years. And even if you don't come to a settlement, or even if you do, after that five-year period, if it's a relator, the relator could potentially carry the case forward because not really if you've settled, I guess. But if you haven't settled, if the government says, no, we're not going to pursue this, you take that as a win. Well, the relator can carry it forward as well, and that might take a couple of years. So th these things can have a very long shelf life. So I do want to say we're giving you a lot of doom and gloom right now. We've probably listed, you know, six to ten things that um, are maybe making your heart rate rise right now um, if you're looking into buying a business. 
all of this is tempered by the underlying standard that applies in the False Claims Act. Remember, you can violate the False Claims Act in three ways. You can make a, a, a knowing violation, and what that means is actual knowledge of the falsity of your statement or your non-compliance of the program, reckless disregard, which is sort of a gross negligence standard, more than negligence, and uh, deliberate indifference, which means you know you should know that stuff around you is is not above board, but you decide to say, you know, what I don't know won't hurt me. So just because there may be a violation of a regulation or a program requirement or um, some other requirement of your contract doesn't mean that every single violation is going to turn into an FCA violation. Um, you, it's really a case by case basis. And that is why we're going to talk about this in a little bit. Due diligence on the front end of a transaction is so important uh, because it sometimes is better when you walk away from a deal that you think might be good if the risks are really high, whereas jumping into a, a transaction um, that you think you need where there's a lot of risk can end up costing you five or six years of defense costs and the potential penalties or settlement. So these are just things you have to think about on the front end. Um, and if you are getting ready for a transaction, these things should definitely be on your radar. Um, yeah, and so the, another thing here is if you're, if, you're the, if you're buying an entity, right, you also need to worry about some of the recertification issues that come into play. If you're buying an, an entity itself, say a stock transaction or equity transaction, when you do that, you have to recertify, if you're a small business or you've gotten work, you have to recertify your own work and you have to recertify on the entity that you're buying their small business work or whatever socioeconomic category it happens to be. Taking into account the combined entity of everything that, that's been done. Um, in that kind of context, that's where small businesses who want to grow through acquisition can run into problems because if they merge and now they're large, they have to recertify, they, that could have implications on their, their current work. And you have to recertify within 30 days of a merger or acquisition. Or if you're talking about an asset transaction, you only recertify on the work that, that you've bought, the contracts that are coming over. And that's 30 days after the innovation is finalized. Um, the good thing with this is that the newest interpretation from the Office of Hearings and Appeals, which came out in February, the newest interpretation of this rule is that if you have an IDIQ contract and you buy an entity that has it and you recertify as large because you're no longer small after the acquisition, you can continue to bid on task orders so long as the contracting officer hasn't requested recertification as to that particular task order. So, this is good because you don't have that false claim act risk from bidding on these things. We now have case law to support you that you're not having false claim act risk by buying a company, recertifying and continue to bid on, on this work. That being said, if the contracting officer expressly requests recertification for a particular task order, then you won't be able to bid if you're not, if you're not large. Um, if you're buying an entity, the way this comes up from an FCA context a lot of times, is if you're buying an entity that has done acquisitions in the past, and let's say they didn't realize they had to recertify, or they thought, oh, I just recertify, I bought company B, but I didn't do a merger. I only recertify as to company B size. I ignore my size as the acquirer, so I'm going to recertify as small. That would have been not a correct statement, right? That would have been an inaccurate representation. Then the question is, well, was it a false claim? Well, should they have known better? And this is where a lot of times DOJ looks at what happened. And if you say, well, look, at the time, the, the entity I just bought, those people had no idea. They misinterpreted the, the law. They thought it, it only had, the recertification only had to do with the buying entity, not the combined entity. If something like that happens, DOJ usually asks, okay, if that's what you're saying, it was just negligence. I want to see a copy of the regulations you looked at, evidence you looked at the regulations. Did you talk to counsel or any sort of advisors about the interpretation of the regulations? And this is also where people get into trouble because there's a lot of consultants out there. They're not lawyers. 
And you might have email correspondence or things. You talk to a consultant. The consultant gave you bad information. That's not privilege. That's not covered by attorney-client privilege or any other privilege. So you have to turn over those correspondence. And if that consultant told you, eh, this is risky, but you know maybe we could make this argument, and you ran with it, that is all discoverable information. And that may be a, a reckless disregard or a deliberate indifference. If someone is out there telling you that there's a potential problem and you haven't run down the lead on that potential problem, um, and you said, well, let's take a chance because I really want this transaction, that's more likely to result in a problem. But if, if legitimately there's no um, triggering event, no red flag or even pink flag that pops up for you, those are um, less likely to result in a False Claims Act violation because what is deliberate indifference? It's it's still generally getting an indication that there is wrongdoing around you. What is reckless disregard? Taking information that you have and it essentially um, negligent. It's more than negligence, though. That it's hard to describe, but it's it's almost to the level of intentional, but it's it's. Um, it wouldn't reach negligent um, mistakes. If you're making a decision with full knowledge of the risks, then you've you've done your due diligence. If you're hearing that there's a red flag and you're ignoring the red flag, that's when you can run into problems. And um, we're gonna start to speed up a little bit because we don't wanna hold you past uh, the hour. But I do wanna answer another question that came in about um, what potentially minor violations can, can create FCA liability. And there's another aspect to an FCA violation and that's materiality. And ultimately for a government contractor, a violation of, uh, of a regulation or a contract requirement or something that would normally give rise to an FCA violation on its own isn't going to be um, a liability unless it was material to the government's decision to pay out a claim or to not seek reimbursement of uh, a reverse claim. So you could potentially have um, a case where, um, I mean, this one could probably go either way, but uh, let's say you're under the limitations on subcontracting by a couple of tenths of a percent over the life of the contract because the agency decided not to exercise the option on the fifth year of a contract. So at the end, you you were front loading the subcontractor's work. You were planning on taking over the majority of the um, the work in the in the later option years, and you don't quite get to 50-50. If this is a contract where um, you don't need to meet the limitations on subcontracting in every option year, you might be a little bit under. The government probably isn't going to find a False Claims Act violation where you were acting in good faith and trying to meet it and had a plan for getting there. Um, that would be probably a minor violation. Now, if you're at 35% and your subcontractors are at 65%, um, you're, let's say you're a small business at 35% and you're large businesses are at 65%, that's a bigger problem. I wouldn't consider that a minor violation. Um, but but that's one example. I could probably give you a thousand examples of minor violations. And so feel free to shoot me an email or give me a call and we can talk through it. But let's uh, let's move on and, and hopefully get people out of here before the hour. Yeah, when you go into some of this small business stuff and the limitation on subcontracting what he was talking about, there's a couple things people tend to think that are that's wrong. One, if the small business, if, if like a woman owned, let's say they own 51% on paper, we're fine. The other thing people screw up with, because that's not, there's a lot more to it, right? Which is at the bottom here, ownership and control, right? The woman actually in that example has to actually have control. They actually have to run the day to day that to be really involved in actually doing the work, right? They can't just be 51% and out to lunch. Similarly, I've had a lot of people say, well, no, 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 we're meeting all, all the rules. We're dealing with this 8A company. We're making sure that they're doing 50% of the cost of the contract if it's a services contract or 15% of its general construction. Again, that's not the whole story. If the small business isn't in control, if the small business say at a construction site doesn't ever have anyone showing up, that's a problem, even if they're getting the money. 
or they're like, oh, well, they're overseeing it for a California job site from Virginia. I've had that case and I can tell you the Department of Justice doesn't agree. They think that there has to be somebody from the small business on site in order to truly control that. So they, things like that, you have to make sure that you're compliant with all of these issues. Another thing that I'm manufacturer, if you're providing supplies, you don't look at the 50 or 15 or whatever percent, right? You're looking at a whole different test. You're under 500 or 150 in some cases. You're a regular dealer. You're taking ownership or possession of the product in a manner consistent with industry practice. Um, and you're providing the, the end product of a small business. See, the, that's what you have to comply with. So depending on what type of contract you are, contractor you're buying or you're, you're selling and you're doing your own diligence, your sell side work, that's what you need, need to look at. Um, also with joint ventures, there's a lot of confusion. The joint venture itself needs to meet the applicable percentage of work and inside of the joint venture. Whatever percentage the members are doing, the qualified members, small business, woman owned, whatever, has to be doing 40% of that work. So take construction, for instance. I've had too many cases where people form joint ventures where they think the woman owned company needs to do 15% and the large business mentor in a mentor project can do 85%. Wrong. The woman has to do 40%. The mentor can do 60%. So in construction, joint ventures don't make sense in a lot of cases because you can have less work done by the qualified entity in a prime sub relationship as opposed to a joint venture. That's not true if you're dealing with services. Services, you can take advantage of the 40, 50%. But again, that's 40% of whatever the joint venture is doing. So if you have joint ventures in a company you're buying or you're selling or doing your own due diligence, you need to look at, okay, this joint venture in a million dollar contract is doing 500,000. Okay, is the qualified business doing 40% of that, the 200,000? If they're doing 800,000, it's 40% of the 800,000. You need to run this. And by the way, this is not across the life of the contract anymore. It's period by period on the contract. And if you have to task order IDIQ contract, it's across all task orders, period by period. So if it's a six month base and a one year option, that first six month period, you have to meet the percentage of work. Then it resets. And the next option, if it's one year, you got to meet it in that period. If it's a three year base and a three year option, you look at the whole three year period. So it, it gets very confusing very, very quickly. Um, so you just got to keep, keep an eye on these things. And keep in mind that the, um, the rules change periodically. And with that long look back period of potentially up to 10 years, you could be talking about um, a different set of regulations that apply to you now. So it's really important to understand when you're purchasing a company, if they have a contract where they are meeting performance obligations six or seven years ago, but, or I'm sorry, that they weren't meeting performance obligations six or seven years ago, that could still rear its ugly head. It, in fact, it could be under investigation at the moment of your purchase. And you need to make sure that you're not looking at through, through your due diligence, the current existing regulations You've got to look at the regulations that apply at all times. Um, with regard to PPP fraud, I, I attended a conference recently where the um, Department of Justice representatives in charge of uh, CARES Act procurement fraud said that um, DOJ is pursuing everyone and no case is too big or too small with regard to PPP loan fraud. So while so far we've seen a large number of small value PPP loan fraud matters, um, the reason those are small value is because they're easier to investigate when you're not talking about a lot of money. But the larger PPP loans are likely to be audited, likely to be investigated, and that they're, uh, if you haven't crossed your T's and dyed your eyes throughout the process, then you could run into some liability. Um, the other thing that was mentioned was uh, private equity funds and how currently DOJ is not targeting private equity funds, but it is on their radar. So if DOJ specifically intends to focus on private equity funds that invest in companies that receive CARES Act funds, where the private equity funds, private equity would be company takes an active role in operation or supervision, or they are participant in the subject illegal contract conduct. It's one thing for a private equity fund to just give money and stand by the wayside and watch the company um, operate itself. It's another when a private equity fund jumps in to help with operations because that's when you start to find private equity liability. Um, 
one thing that's important is that DOJ may actually end up holding due diligence against the buyer because ultimately um, you have that more likely to have a knowledge and meet the knowledge requirement if you're doing due diligence and making the call to buy or sell after due diligence. But a lack of due diligence can also be deliberate indifference because if you go into an M&A transaction without looking under the hood, you're you can almost expect to to find whatever problem um, is existing to be found against you as well. So uh, due diligence, as I've said a couple times, is super, super important. Um, you want to make sure during your due diligence process for the transaction that you are requesting um, disclosure of any subpoenas, civil investigative demands, and crimin criminal or civil inquiries and all knowledge of sealed and unsealed litigation. Um, the reason you ask for a broad range of documents is because the government uses different types of documents to obtain information about a False Claims Act violation. Um, you will want to ensure Small Business Administration compliance. If, if you're a small business, if you're a, a socioeconomic set-aside business, you want to make sure that um, you're in compliance with the value, the size standards that apply to your business, for including for all individual contracts. Remember, you may have different NAICS codes that apply to different contracts, and you want to make sure that you're small for the specific contract in question, of course, subject to the uh, waivers and the regulations. You want to check for contract compliance. This is a really good example of the cybersecurity requirements um, issue that Sai has brought up. Um, you want to make sure that you're following this express requirements of a contract. Look at those FAR clauses that are incorporated by reference. Read the entire thing, um, not just the statement of work. Um, you want to make sure that you are running inter internal checklists to ensure that the, um, that the material terms of the contract are being performed. You want to check for training protocols. What is the seller doing to ensure that its employees are complying with obligations of the contract? Or the regulations. You also want to run a full audit of PPP eligibility. Was the company eligible for the PPP loan when it was applied? Was the company eligible when it applied for forgiveness? Is it possible that the company was in violation um, by receiving two PPP loans on a first draw instead of a first draw and a second draw? A lot of people lately have thought that that's okay because I would have qualified for a second draw PPP loan if I had just waited. No, it's not okay. You're only allowed one first draw and one second draw to qualifying businesses. So the fact that you would have gotten the same exact amount of money later, maybe we'll argue materiality for you, but you're still in technical violation of the regulations. And frankly, you should have known at the time that you applied for that second loan or received that second loan that you were doing so um, in violation of the law. And this last thing really quickly, this is really not less FCA, more liability. You need to know that there's a FAR credits clause that DCAA is likely going to apply for cost reimbursable contracts. And they're going to, if you got PPP forgiveness, you could owe money back to the federal government whenever they do the incurred cost submission and DCA audits that. And to the extent you're trying to get around that by providing bad information or things, there could be FCA things there. So just, just be aware of that as well. So an important note, Whistleblower cases, those key TAM actions we talked about, they're sealed, so you won't technically know that one has been filed, but there are flags that you can see that make you believe that either an investigation is ongoing or a key TAM action has been filed. Um, you'll, usually there'll be a subpoena or a civil investigative demand or a direct email from the Department of Justice requesting information or an office inspector general. You're going to want to request data and information about informal and formal HR employee complaints. If they have disgruntled former employees who have made complaints about billings to the government, non-payments to subcontractors, PPP loan eligibility, cybersecurity, or made the statement that there is a false certification or non-compliance with the government obligation, all of those things are hot button issues and could result in FCA liability or be an indication that you are, that the buyer can ultimately be subject to, uh, or the seller can be subject to a future key TAM action filed by that disgruntled former employee.
so wrapping up here, protecting yourself from liability, you want to make sure that the company is taking employee complaints seriously and investigating all complaints. For a buyer, that could be any complaints you receive right after taking control. Sometimes um, we've seen uh, long-term employees walk into HR on day one or day two of new ownership and say, and they spill their guts saying, here's all of the problems that I've seen. Your obligation then is to investigate those very quick, very quickly. Make sure you're doing an internal audit and investigation. Like Sai said, if you find a problem, you probably need to do a mandatory disclosure, but you can talk about that directly with counsel at the time because there are some exceptions. Um, you wanna make sure to avoid any potential liability, you wanna make sure that your purchase agreement as full indemnification without any cap for FCA or investigation issues, especially on PPP loans. Now, that is gonna make your purchase a little unattractive. We understand that it might mean that it's non-competitive. What we're talking about here is um, you may have caps on indemnification for certain types of things, negligence claims, trip and falls, uh, workers comp, anything like that. But what we're talking about is the cap on an potential FCA liability, because ultimately the FCA violation was committed by a, a specific actor prior to the purchase. You want to make sure that you have as much protection as possible there. Um, so again, what do you do if you discover a past or current violation? Rectify it as quickly as possible. Make a mandatory disclosure where possible and where uh, the advice of counsel under the specific circumstances. Um, would make that a wise move. Um, if you make that mandatory disclosure, the liability that comes from an FCA violation can be reduced by what's called cooperation credits. Uh, but the failure to submit a mandatory disclosure when required can be an aggravating factor that could lead to criminal penalties or an increase in the settlement value of an FCA claim. Uh, so you may want to make special representations and warranties um, related to FCA liability in your purchase agreement. Um, as Sai mentioned earlier, you want a long look back at least six years for claims related to the FCA um, or violation of laws or regulations. Um, again, you want to increase or eliminate caps on liability for FCA indemnification. Um, there are Sometimes in the last uh, few years, we've seen requests from um, sellers or, uh, yes, sellers that are asking for um, non-disclosure or uh, uh, essentially a gag order, confidentiality order on uh, any indemnification claims. You wanna be very careful about that because ultimately that could hamstring your ability to do a mandatory disclosure or it could rope you into litigation. Uh, with the seller um, in the event that an FCA violation does come up. Um, again, this is a non-disparagement clause. You want to make sure, uh, make sure you're carving out that truthful statements made in good faith to law enforcement officials um, are permitted. Um, depending on due diligence, it is possible to sue a seller for fraud in the inducement irrespective of liability limits. You want to make sure that you're looking into that if you were are in the unfortunate circumstances of finding yourself with an FCA violation. Um, and you also want to think about suspension and debarment risks. It is not going to give you any benefit whatsoever to buy a company for $10 million with the hope that you can make $40 million later if the company is going to be suspended or debarred, debarred for fraud within six months of purchase. So that's something you really want to think about that's a case-by-case -case basis issue, but it's something to, to keep on your radar. Again, so I talked about this earlier, FCA violations can take five or more years to resolve. Um, Sai and I actually had a case recently that I think we started looking into it six years ago, and it is still going strong. So keep in mind that um, when you're buying a company, when you're selling a company, um, that these, these issues can follow you for many years to come. And what to do if, if you uh, get a subpoena, a civil investigative demand, uh, an inquiry from the Department of Justice or RIG. Stop your routine document and email destruction and auto archives. Um, you wanna get counsel immediately. 
um, perf make sure through counsel or if possible, um, immediately before even hiring counsel, do an internal investigation to understand the, the scope of the complaint and the li potential liability. You wanna verify your paper trail. What I mean by that is ensure that you have the documents to back up what you've said. So if someone has come after you on a construction contract, for instance, for not having certified payrolls, uh, it's a bit of a nuanced issue for the construction industry, you wanna go back and make sure that you have the documents to back it up. If the government is asking for it, they, they wanna see them. And then finally, document, 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 what I'm talking about there is that document everything that you do as part of the investigation, the audit, make sure that you have everything backed up. So at the end of the day, you can show the government that you've done everything you can to, um, to keep yourself above board. All right, sorry, we ran a little long, but thanks everybody. I know there's a couple questions, we'll get to those, we'll shoot you some emails and, and follow up. So thank, thanks again, and uh, I guess we'll see everybody next time in the next webinar. All right, thanks everybody.